So what was it like uh, growing up when you were young, the son of a professional athlete? Well, uh, you know, my dad played pro football before he wrestled, so you know we were exposed to that life. But once he started wrestling, uh, you know, we moved from territory to territory. We moved from a couple of different Texas territories, which were uh, uh, Corpus Christi territory, and then uh, North Texas. Then we moved uh, to Minnesota, and he worked in the Minneapolis uh, territory. And then we moved to uh, Indiana, then out into uh, the East Coast a couple times, probably three different times we lived out there. But I think we counted, I think we went to like 14 or 15 different schools from the time I was in first grade to high school. <laughs> Did your dad uh, kayfabe you on the business? Yeah, he did pretty much. I mean, I went with him a couple times. Uh, well, more than a couple times, but but I, I went with him some. But you know, he never let me in the dress room, never around the other guys. I always just sat up in in the bleachers and and watched the matches. But uh, yeah, it wasn't until I was probably out of out of college or during college that he was, was acting <laughs> smart to me about the business. Did you have problems with any kids in school ever uh, with calling your dad fake or anything like that? No, I never did. and never ran into that, but I guess it's just because he was just such a strong heel. Uh, he, was, he was just such a bad guy that nobody talked about him like that. And you played football at West Texas State, is that right? Yeah. Were there any other wrestlers playing on the team at that time? Because I know it has a big alumni of wrestlers. Uh, Manny Fernandez was there while I was there, and uh, Kelly Kaniski. He was my roommate. So those two were there during that time. Everyone knows Manny, but Kelly Kaniski, he had some WWE uh, enhancement matches in the late 80s, I guess. Yeah, and he was with uh, Jim Crockett Promotions in the early 80s. He was, uh, his father was Gene Kaniski, a former world NWA champion. Now, when did you decide you were going to become a pro wrestler? Well, it was while I was at West Texas State. I would say it was probably during my second, third semester at school. And, uh, I, I just I just started going to the towns and refereeing. So I was refereeing and hauling the ring, setting up chairs for the local promotion. So I mean I was busy and I was gone all the time. I would I'd make it back for football practices and class and then I'd be gone right away, back out on the road. So that was the Funks promotion, I assume? Yeah, it was it was at that time. Was Terry wrestling by that point? Uh Terry was a wrestling there. Let's see. Dick Murdoch. Uh, Dick Murdoch was out there. J.J. Dillon. That's when I first met J.J. while I was in college. Uh, that was set last of 78, early 79. Did you, I guess you knew Dick Murdoch from your father. Um, did you ever... Uh, experience any of the crazy stories that Dick's known for? Well, I traveled with Dickie for a year while I was out there. And I was his constant companion. Dickie was, he was a crazy man. <laughs> he drank two cases of beer a night and drove 120 miles an hour in a pickup truck. <laughs> he was something. <laughs> <laughs> now, who actually trained you to become a pro wrestler? Uh, I started at the Sportatorium in Tampa. And, I, you know, Hero was there. You know, Dusty was there, you know, every every night because I, I was also, I was working. So I was, I was doing Broadway matches, you know, 10 and 15, 20 and 30 minutes through every night. So, you know, I was also working with the, with the, uh, the prelim guys there too, so I mean, I mean it was just uh, it was a uh, it was an in ring education that I got. But I had already refereed for a year, and you know I I, I knew what was going on. I just 
wasn't physically able to at that point. What led to you uh, joining the Florida Territory? Well, the, the Briscoes were in, uh, were working in Charlotte and uh, they're in the Charlotte Territory and there was a show in Greensboro and I was with my dad and uh, we talked to them about me starting in Florida and uh, I started a week later after that show. <laughs> was Kevin Sullivan booking at that time? No, Kevin wasn't there then. Uh, let's see, that was the... That was probably the last of 79, probably Christmas of 79. Uh, no, Kevin wasn't there for a few more years. Is that where you first started teaming with Mike Rotundo? Yep. Uh, I actually met Mike in Toronto in 1980 when I was up there uh, doing a show. I was working with Stud as Blackjack Mulligan Jr. and Dick Byers brought Rotundo in the dressing room to introduce him to everybody. He was just breaking him in. He was just about to go to Germany and I met him then. So you were uh, Blackjack Mulligan Jr. at one point. I didn't yeah. know that. I was for uh, Jim Crockett Promotions. It oh, was, they were working with the Tunnies at one point, I guess. Yeah. How did you like that gimmick? Well, it, the way I got into it is that I was down in Florida and I was riding with Manny Fernandez back from a double shot. We had done Jacksonville and Fort Lauderdale and we had a wreck on the way back and uh, I had a pretty serious head injury. I, I was out for two weeks, so my old man came and got me and got all my stuff and took me to his house. I slept on the floor for two weeks straight and I just woke up every now and then. And then uh, I stayed there with him and I was Blackjack Mulligan Jr. Your, your dad was known as a really tough guy. Did you ever witness any of his uh, outside of the ring battles? Well, I've seen him in the ring go at Ole, you know, but he and Ole just never got along for some reason. <laughs> I don't know which one rubbed the other one the wrong way, but they didn't like each other. They had several battles, and I was there firsthand to see them, but it was just, mostly it was just my old man just roughing him up. He never really hurt him or anything. Now, when Mike was in Florida with you, was that the time the Briscoes played the rib on him that he got caught on the fence? Or were you, was that before you guys were together? No, oh, he was, that happened to him up in Charlotte. Oh, okay. What happened there exactly? Because I've heard a lot of different versions of that. I've heard the story a few times, but I, I just know that he was out and it was late at night and he'd been drinking and he tried to get in the pool and he slipped on the fence. <laughs> <laughs> Did you guys click right away as a tag team? Yeah, I mean, you know, when we met, you know, that there was, we just clicked. And then when uh, when he came to Florida, you know, I remembered him and he remembered me and we were friends automatically. Yeah, we were, we've been good friends since the start. How early into your friendship did he start dating your sister? Probably about uh, two years after after he had been in Florida. Did that concern you at all, knowing how uh, wrestlers could be on the road? No, because I knew Rotundo, and he's Rotundo was a real he's a real good stand-up guy. So I mean, he just <laughs> he, he's a good guy. I trust him. When you uh, joined the WWE with him in 1984, uh, what led to that? They just recruited you, or? Well, we had just, we had left the Florida Territory in 84. We had the show at the uh, Orange Bowl, and Dusty was booking, and Dusty felt like that uh, they gave him a short count. So, Basically, the whole company just went to uh, Jim Crockett Promotions 
we just up and left Florida. I went to Jim Crockett Promotions and then went right into it. But that first, uh, I'd say the first six or eight months, nobody was making any money. And I had made uh, three checks, three weeks checks of $150 a week. And I had, like a nut, I just bought a new Corvette, so. I drove the Corvette back to the dealership, and then I gave my notice. I was started for Vince the next night. That was the first time we went. Okay. And I was there for a few months, and then uh, and then Mike came. Was it planned for him to come to be partners, or was he going to be a signals originally? Well, he, he and my sister were newly married, and you know, and we're we're really close friends. And, and I knew if I was making 150 bucks, he was making 100. So, you know, just I just wanted to keep him and my sister fed too. So I just shot it past Vince and he said, yeah, so here came Mike. Was it Vince that came up with the US Express name? I don't know who came up with that. It just, uh, you know, it just, it just happened, but uh, I'm sure it was him, and it was probably Vince. The Hulk Hogan's music was originally your music first. Uh, why did they switch it to Hulk? Well, we had all been using music that was, you know, we were using Born in the USA, and I think that the company had to start paying copyrights on everything. And uh, I had been there for about a year and a half, or two years. And uh, I left and Spivey went back in, so I think that they just uh, just took it off of me and Rotundo and gave it to Hogan because it was, you know, it, they didn't have to pay any copyright and it was done by Jimmy. Do you have any, uh, any memories that stand out about the first WrestleMania? Was the first first time I met The Rock. The Rock was, I think he was 13 years old. And me and Rotunda were the youngest guys in the dressing room, so he came down and hung out with us in our dressing room for a couple hours. And, and uh, you know, other than that, I just, as usual on any big show, you, you know, you plan on doing 20 minutes and you end up getting cut down from 20 to 15 to 10 to 7. I don't remember how how long the match was, but it was cut down a whole lot from what it was supposed to be. So that was a condensed version. <laughs> the Iron Sheik went on in later years, once uh, internet came out, to be known as like a really insane, mentally unstable individual. Was he always like that, or is he, he's always been that way? And, and I'm sure he still is. <laughs> Memories of your matches against uh, Beefcake and Valentine? Uh, I mean, you know, it, it was easy work. And uh, we did the thing here in Philadelphia to where, uh, uh, I think it was their manager, Jimmy. Anyway, put the cigar out in my eye, but, but uh, I just wasn't up for the idea of having to wear an eye patch for for the rest of my career so you know that I'm sure that uh, Valentine is hot about that you know because I, I left right at the beginning of the program but but it was just uh, it, it was a, it was a different time in the business we traveled every day we, you know we would work in Spokane Washington one night and Miami the next night so we'd have to do all our sleeping on the planes and it, it was just a rough life what did you think of uh, Brutus Beefcake's wrestling ability? Because there's a lot of different opinions on that. <laughs> well, I mean, he, you know, he, he, he's, he's found a gimmick that, that he can live with, so that's fine. But, but his actual wrestling ability is, I, I, you know, I wouldn't say it's up to par with, with mine or Mike, but, but he had a good partner, Valentine, that could lead him. Then, you know, it worked out for them. They, they had a good run. But uh, I, I don't think I ever worked a single with Eddie, so I don't know how he was as a single.
And you did an appearance with Roddy Piper on Piper's Pit. Um, did you know him at all outside of the ring? Yeah, uh, from back in Crockett Promotions. You know, he was good pals with my dad. He traveled with my dad, roomed with my dad on the road. But I didn't really ever get to know Piper, you know, because he was just, he was a little older than me and he just ran in different crowds, I guess. Did you have much interaction with Hulk Hogan during that uh, WWE run? You mean as far as? Like backstage, uh, like was he was he with you got in the same dressing room or did he have his own no, dressing room? No, no, we, we hardly ever saw him, you know, he, hey, he was a big star. You know, he had his own dress room, his own planes, and <laughs> yeah, he, he lived a life. We hardly ever saw him. So, as you mentioned, I guess you the whole reason you left was due to the eye patch, or was there more to it than that? Well, I mean, it was just a, it was just the work schedule. Mike and I had been ninety six days straight, and we were in uh, Baltimore, and we were playing car tag with a bunch of the other guys. And tail lights and headlights got knocked out of cars, so Rotundo just he left he, he, he left and said he was going home so he, he he left me there in Baltimore that night and I guess he flew home and uh, I we had to work in Boston the next night so I went to Boston and I I, I told him that I quit and Rotundo was at home and uh, I went home and then Rotundo came right back the next day. <laughs> so, so I was the heel, I had to stay. <laughs> I stayed home. I guess in those days there was no cell phones, so there wasn't much communication with you guys. In the yeah, yeah. It, it makes you wonder how you got by, you know, the, the way communication is now with texting and calling and everything, but we did it. And you had an appearance for AWA at the Wrestle Rock uh, Rumble. Do you have any memories of that big match? That was a big stadium uh, show in 86. Did we work with Kern? Yeah, the, I think the fabulous yeah. ones. Yeah, Kern and Stan Lane. Uh, you know, I just remembered that it was in the stadium and I remember, you know, the ring being set up in the middle of the stadium. Uh, Mike and I were just in and out of there, so you know, there wasn't a lot. We, we were in that day and out the next morning, so we weren't really there long either. Is there any reason why you never worked full-time for uh, Vern, because your dad was uh, very successful in that territory? I just, I guess by the time that uh, I guess Vince had pretty much taken over by '84, and there wasn't there weren't many places to go because I, I never went to uh, uh, Mid South, you know, down there for Watts or uh, for for Vern. So I just I just missed it. You came back to Crockett. You had a lot of matches against Ric Flair. Um, what made you want to go to the singles route, or was that a Crockett decision? Well, I had been in tags for years, and uh, you know, I'd also worked single some, and it was just uh, it was just time to make a go of it on my own. How did you like working with Rick at that time? Oh, well, it was always easy. I mean, it was a night off. You know, even if we did an hour, it was you know, it was it was just a workout. Really, is all it was. It was. Uh, you know, we had phenomenal matches, good chemistry, and uh, it just it just went well. Did you ever, uh, in those earlier days, have the chance to uh, go out partying with him? With Rick? Yeah. Oh, let's see. I'm. Uh, sure when I was in high school that I was at Rick's house at a party <laughs> so I mean I've known Rick since I was 14 years old so I've been around Rick a lot so 
nothing he does surprises me. <laughs> <laughs> and it's probably a good thing there was no cell phones in those days for some of his exploits. I, I don't. I don't think we actually could have gotten away with some of the stuff that we did because you just had to keep in too much uh, touch with the way cell phones are now. Then you could disappear for a week and nobody would know. <laughs> And you ended up uh, teaming with Ronnie Garvin. How did you like him? Yeah, Ronnie was good. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, he was a good partner. He was uh, he was well known. And uh, let's see, we won the uh, Mid Atlantic Tag Straps for uh, I think we won them twice. And wasn't it one of those times against the Midnight Express? Yep. yep. How were they in the ring? I mean, working with Bobby Eaton is is easy. He's Bobby Eaton was one of the easiest uh, easiest guys ever to work with. Yeah, he, he could work with a with a broom, and Stan was easy too. Uh, also, you know, Dennis Condry was really good too, and he was one of the Midnight Express. So, you know, all three of those guys were really good. And Cornette as a manager was, you know, phenomenal. And you had some matches against the Russians when it was Barry Darso and Ivan Koloff. Uh, what did you think of those matches? Well, I always liked working with Ivan. You know, Ivan was, you know, he's an icon, or he was an icon. And, uh, and, and Barry is just a big, raw bone rascal. So, I mean, it, it, they, they were good matches. They were easy, and, and it, was, it was fun. And uh, you were paired with Lex Luger for some matches, and I guess he was pretty green in those days. Uh, were you doing a lot of teaching when you were in the ring with him? Yeah. That's, I mean, uh, Luger started out with me down in Florida. Let's see, it was 80... I guess 85 or 86, he was down in Florida. And... Uh, he had just started, so yeah, that was, you know, it was part of my job was teaching him in the ring. Were you there that night in Florida where the, he had that incident in the ring with Brody where Luger left the match? Yeah, it was a cage match, and uh, what it was, uh, you know, Brody was just an intimidating guy, but he he didn't do anything to Luger. He just, you know, he just, he just wouldn't talk to him. <laughs> So, so Luger left the left the ring. <laughs> Did Brody say anything when he came back to indicate that he was angry about something, or was it just? No, he, he wondered where Luger went. You know, he wondered what happened, but but I mean, you, you had to know you had to know Brody, and that was just his personality. He, he probably didn't like Luger anyway. You know, he was just, you know, he was a pretty boy, so. Some people over the years have said he had an air against about him backstage, but I'm guessing since you were one of the top guys, he probably didn't display that much. With Luger? Yeah. Well, uh, he was just that way. And that's just the way he was. Did you ever work Brody yourself? Yeah, yeah, I worked with him in Japan a bunch with him and Stan against uh, me and uh, Tennessee stud Ron Fuller in 1980 or 81. We were in the tag tournament, the Thanksgiving tag tournament. So I got educated to Brody and Hanson quickly. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm sure coming from Amarillo, you were familiar with that uh, hard hitting style. Yeah, and, and with Brody being a West Texas boy and, and Stan being a West Texas boy, uh, you know, they, 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 they took to me, they liked me, and I was Mulligan's kid, so so they liked me. They, they took care of me on that tour, but they beat the hell out of, out of Ron Fuller. <laughs> <laughs> so you said you never worked for uh, Mid-South, but did you ever have any interaction with Bill Watts? Uh, in those years? Just when he was booking at uh, WCW. Okay. Yeah, that was it. Towards the late 80s, 
you ended up joining the WWF. Um, what was it that led you to make that jump? Uh, I had, uh, it's when uh, TBS had bought the company from, from uh, Turner and uh, they were giving out contracts and you know, and it, you know, I was always a business guy, you know, for Dusty and everybody. So I always waited last and didn't complain about payoffs and shit like that. But you know, just, just sometimes enough is enough. And they were giving out contracts, and they, I remember they gave the Ward uh, Road Warriors either seven hundred or seven hundred fifty thousand or a million dollars a year, and you know, I I, I went in to see. Uh, Oh, I don't know what it was. I broke my wrist in uh, Columbus, Georgia, and so I, I had a cast on my wrist, and I went in to see uh, Jim Hurd, and uh, he said I had a fake cast on my hand, and that my hand wasn't hurt. So th that was it. I just left, and then uh, and he called me back about six or eight months later and asked me to come back to work, but. Uh, well, no, it was it was more than six months. It was about a year later. But I had, I had gone to work for Vince as a widowmaker, and, uh, and then my dad and my brother had gotten got into their legal uh, trouble. So, you know, I just told Vince it'd be better if I stayed at home right now for a while. The widowmaker is that a, a gimmick that someone in WWE came up with for you? I don't I don't know if that was Vince's or I don't know whose it was. It seemed like uh, you had a pretty long undefeated streak there. Um, I know you left on your own terms, but did they ever tell you what, what plans they had? Were you going to feud with Hogan, or it seemed like they were going to build you as a main event heel? No, we, we, we never got uh, into talking about anything. So it's just... Uh... And when you were with the Four Horsemen, how did you like being part of that group? Because most people say that uh, your incarnation of the Horsemen was the greatest uh, pairing of the four. Well, I, I would like to think that it is. Uh, you know, it was just uh, because I worked with Arn and Tully and Rick so much. You know, I, I I knew I knew how they worked and how they operated, and uh, you know we had Bluger and Sting and the Steiners, and Dustin. I mean, we, we were loaded up on the babyface side, and I was, you know, it was time to, to do something, to do a switch, and and uh, you know I talked to Dusty about it, and then we talked to Rick, and uh, we made the decision. We did it in Jacksonville, Florida, turned heel. How did the fans take that? Uh, because a lot of them still believed in those days and you were such a strong baby face for all those years. Well, and Jacksonville was a strong baby face town for me too. So it was just, you know, it just gave it that much more, uh, more shock value. Doing it in Florida and in Jacksonville, you know, where I'd been for all those years. So uh, it, it just helped it along. Anytime you can Record a reaction on TV and show it to somebody else. It's gonna, you know, it's just gonna amplify their reaction too, as far as you know, heel turns or angles for wrestling. So it worked out really well. Uh, how did you feel about the WWE uh, choosing your group of the Four Horsemen to be the ones inducted into the Hall of Fame? Well, I, I mean, uh, I, I'm glad. I'm glad that we got inducted. Uh, I personally think it was the best uh, uh, unit of the four, four horsemen. You know, I like to consider myself the best fourth horseman, and uh, it, it just gelled. It was just something that worked, and uh, you know, it, it could have gone on for for longer than it did. You know, if things had stayed together, but uh, it was you know it had its time, and it was good when it happened. Uh, many people wonder why you were never given the world title around around the late 80s time, early 90s. 
Um, do you know if there was ever any serious consideration of making you world champion? Well, I, I had been asked, you know, if I wanted to be champion and and I just wasn't ready. You know, I wasn't ready to, to put in the workload that, you know, that Rick did. But uh, when it came, you know, time for me to do it is when, uh, you know, Rick was headed to New York too. He was supposed to drop the belt to me and he, he took it to, uh, to New York. So that's another story. So was there ever any um, hard feelings over that, that the title wasn't dropped? Because I guess he claimed that he said he was willing to drop it to you, but he ended up FedExing it back later on after legal. Yeah, it, it was, you know, it, it was just a, a contract negotiation for Rick and, and he used it as a, as a, as a bargaining chip and, you know, more power to him. Is there any reason, I know you were in the match for the for the world title in the end, but is there any reason you were told why it wasn't given to you? Because I think it was put on Luger or, or something at that point. Wasn't it in Baltimore or somewhere like that? Yeah, uh, but with Flair gone, it, you know, we were, we were weak on the heel side again, and I was a baby face again, so, you know, we just, we just made a decision to put it on Luger. And, you know, it was uh, it was just a business decision. Were you on the booking committee ever uh, in the NWA or Crockett or WCW? Yeah, at uh, at uh, WCW and with uh, Jim Crockett when Dusty was booking, I helped. So. Okay. Were you, what was your specialty? Were you uh, more of a finish guy coming up with creative finishes or were you a guy coming up with angles or kind of all of the above? Well, I mean, finishes aren't really too hard. You just, you just kind of work for the end result and go backwards. But uh, I, most of mine, you know, were just creative ideas for, for guys and angles and stuff like that, mostly. And you had a feud with Nikita Koloff. Uh, what was he like to work with? It wasn't a work with Nikita. Everything was snug. <laughs> yeah, because I guess he had very little to possibly no training uh, when yeah. he was signed, right? <laughs> now, I interviewed Vader and he claimed that uh, he believed Nikita exaggerated the reason for his retirement due to injury to collect on uh, Lloyd's of London policy. Uh, did you did you ever see the um, the injury that s supposedly put uh, Nikita out? No, I, I haven't. Okay. Yeah. I don't know that there were any Lloyd's of London policies left over at that point, so I don't know. Yeah, apparently he was part of the the Minnesota group that all all got them at once. Yeah, he must have had it for years. Because he, he's one of the few that never came back. Uh, I don't think he wrestled at all after that. And memories of working with Dusty Rhodes. Well, I mean, Dusty was, you know, my best friend for years, and my mentor, and and uh, we traveled together. It was just, uh, and then f finally getting to work with him. Uh, you know, he he sold for me. I, I didn't think that he would. <laughs> I thought that it would be difficult to get him to work, but but he worked, and I mean, he went. Instead of his usual six or seven minutes a night, he went 20 and sometimes 30 minutes with me a night. So it was good. And some people over the years have had mixed things to say about him as his booker, uh, some of the four horsemen, I guess, had some issues with him. Uh, what was your opinion overall of him as a booker? Well, I mean, you just don't know that job until you do it. And it's, it's, it's a difficult job. And, and juggling all those personalities and trying to make everybody happy is 
it's not going to happen. So there's always going to be somebody that's negative about it. But I mean, he, he was a, su a successful booker, and you can see all the shows that he booked, you know, that are still running now. So. And what do you think of his uh, children and his wrestlers, Dustin and uh, Cody? Well, Dustin and I were real close friends for years. I, I haven't seen Dustin in probably about five or six years now. Uh, I mean, Dustin and uh, and Cody are they are just super talented in the ring and uh, on the mic. So I mean. They got it from their old man. They're just super talented. And uh, how was working with Sting? Well, I, early in his career, you know, uh, I was a babyface with him, so I, it was, you know, it was easy. It was just, uh, I'm, I'm sure that. Uh, it was a lot easier being a babyface with him than it was a heel working against him because I had to try to direct him all the time in the ring too. But, but that was just you know that was something that we did as as the horsemen, you know, just ring generals, just trying to run the match, and tried to get it to go the way we wanted it to. And you had some matches with Bam Bam Bigelow. Uh, did you like working against him? Yeah, yeah, Bam Bam. You know, he was a huge guy, and he would. You know, he liked to bump, and and he and he, he enjoyed the business. So it was, it, they were always good matches with Bam Bam. Uh, some people, when he first went to WWE, were saying that he uh, was a problem backstage. Did he ever display any of that to you? Bam Bam? Yeah. No. No, never saw it. Not down there. And eventually they put Sid with the Four Horsemen. What did you think of that idea? Well, I mean, Sid was, you know, he's such a big and, and impressive looking guy that, you know, to be a horseman, you either had to be impressive or you had to have really great ring skills. And Sid, you know, just fit in the Im impressive because he wasn't exceptionally good on the mic, but he just looked so devastating. It, uh, you know, we worked around him when he was in there, so it was just, uh, it was just par for the course for the rest of us. Now, when I interviewed Sid, he mentioned that uh, the thing that you were part of at Halloween Havoc 1990, he said he didn't know the real ending of the match. Do you think he was bluffing on that? Or? What was that now? What happened in 90? That was the one where I guess you were dressed as Sting. Oh, and oh, then, in Chicago. Yeah, he said he said he didn't realize anything was going to happen after that. But <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it, we put together a finish for him and went through everything. But, uh, you know, it was just, uh, we thought of it that morning. I had, I had been off, I had been home. Uh, and uh, it was just a start back date for me and we needed something for me to make an impact. So I went to the hair salon with Sting and dressed up as him and we did that finish. So as far as you were aware, Sid was aware of the full finish that night, not yeah. just the first half. Yeah, he was. <laughs> <laughs> he might have forgotten it. <laughs> Uh, you had some matches with you. Those were two pretty huge guys. They were pretty tough. Uh, what were they like in the ring to work with? Who's that? Uh, Butch Reed and Ron Simmons. Oh yeah. I mean, it, I guess you know. I like working with guys that work snug. So you know, it was it was nothing for me. And then Arn liked it too. So I mean, they were always good matches, and they were, you know, they were believable. And that's what we always worked for. And uh, Brian Pillman has gone on to be a pretty uh, legendary character in the business. What was your feud with him like? Well, it, uh, you know, when it was when I was a heel, and. Uh, we were, you know, we were just trying to 
to drum up some interest and uh, we shot the angle with Pillman and uh, it's, it's when he was the yellow dog, right? Is that what you're talking yeah. about? Yeah, and it, I mean, it just, uh, it didn't feel the same to me as when we had done it in Florida, but I mean, it, it worked for him. And, it, and he, he worked, Pillman was a good worker in the ring too, so he was easy to work with and you know, he could do anything you asked him to do. Do you think if it wasn't for his accident, he would have uh, gone on to be more of a star in the business? Oh yeah, absolutely. It just, you know, it was just a dumb mistake. I guess you were around for Magnum's accident too. I was in Florida. It was after I had left New York and I was working okay. in Florida. And uh, he and I both had Porsches, so when I was working for Vince, he came down to Florida and I let him borrow one of my Porsches to go from Tampa to Fort Myers, and he had to have one after that, so he got it. And, you know, I always warned him, I said, you gotta learn how to drive these cars. They drive different, you know, they're the rear-wheel uh, rear drive 911s. And, you know, it just, it just bit him. Now, you worked with Steve Austin in WCW. Uh, obviously, he went on to be one of the biggest stars of all time in wrestling. Could you see it at all in those days, his potential? Oh, yeah. I mean, and Dusty and I talked about him, too. And, uh, you know, that's, Dusty put the TV title on him and had him work around with everybody. And, you know, we knew he had potential. We just had to figure out what to do with it. Did you ever uh, go hunting with him or anything since you're both into that? With Austin? Yeah. No, never been hunting with him. Did you ever spend any time with him outside of the ring, uh, traveling or anything? Not really. Okay. Um, thoughts on Paul Heyman uh, when he was in the Dangerous Alliance? He's gone on to have a lot of success since those days. Well, I mean, Paul's a smart guy too, as far as the business goes. I mean, you know, he's run his own company and and uh, he's still going strong. So, uh, uh, never had any problems with Paulie. I, I, always just good things, you know, so he's a credit to the business. And he manages Brock Lesnar now. Uh, what do you think about Brock Lesnar as a wrestler? You know, he, he, he's the ultimate wrestler. And, uh, you know, I, I see the problems that Vince is having, you know, with him trying to beat him or, you know, because when you put the title on somebody like that, how do you get it off of him? So he's got him in three-way matches and all that to where he doesn't have to drop the fall. But it's just, to have somebody that strong, it, it's hard to work around too. So, I mean, as far as the office and, uh, other talent so you know you just kind of know who's who <laughs> what do you think about the situation uh, with today's wrestling where there's a lot of wrestlers that aren't really over as mega stars and then there's a lot of part-time stars that have big demands and special deals well I mean you know that, that means Rock and Lesnar and you know Hogan when he comes back but uh, I mean, it's good for business, but it's but it's not necessarily good for the dressing room. You know, when you have guys doing that, because you have guys out there that are humping it every day and every night, going to all those towns, putting in all the time, and then you have big stars coming into the big shows and taking all the money. So it's just, I mean, you have to understand it's it's Vince's company and it's his money, so we work for him. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, working with uh, Ricky Steamboat and Shane Douglas, I'm going to guess that you enjoyed those matches. Oh, yeah. Two easy guys to work with. Super easy. And the great Muto, how was that? Well, I mean, you know, when he came back over to drop the title to me, it was, it was just to drop the title, so... 
I mean, I wish we could have had a better match, but you know, he, he just he just wasn't wasn't into it, and you know, I did what I could. Did that help your popularity in Japan at all, winning the title from him because it still meant something to the Japanese fans? You know, I don't know because I don't know that I went back over there after that very many times. And uh, you left WCW again around the time that Flair returned from WWE. Was that just a coincidence or... Was there some heat there due to uh, him not dropping the title to you before he left? Let's see. That was, what, 90? He, he left, I think, in 91, and he came back around 93-ish, 94. Oh, I had, uh, I had a knee injury. I had to have knee surgery. So okay. I had my it was knee redone a couple times. And then I guess you came back a year later to wrestle Flair. Yeah, and, and it blew my knee out again right at the beginning of the match in Philadelphia. And we still went, I guess we went 30, 30 minutes, but I, my knee was completely gone right at the beginning of the match. I had to have surgery again. I had to have completely reconstruction on my surgery, on my knee. Is that what led to, I guess you took some time off yeah. after that, a good amount of time? And uh, was it WWE that contacted you during your time off uh, for you to come back? Uh, I went, went to WWE in 96, or the latter part of 95. I guess, you know, just because I had the knee injury and, and Bischoff and all of them were still at WCW, I just, you know, I always flip flop back and forth between the companies anyway. So I just, you know, gave Vince a call and went up there to see him and he hired me. Yeah, I forgot to ask you about uh, Bischoff at that time. Were you happy when he took over WCW with some of the previous management there that had been not very qualified or well I was I was gone with knee injury when Bischoff took over and then because I just came back for the one match and I destroyed my knee again I was out you know probably three years total so that was Bischoff's first three years then I went to uh, New York in 96 and I was there till uh, the end of 97 and then uh, I came back to work for WCW. So uh, when you came back as the stalker, is that a gimmick that you had in mind or did they just say, we don't want to bring you back as Barry Windham? Yeah, Vince just, he just never did, you know, he never did want to utilize me as, as just me. And I don't know why, but uh, you know, the stalker was his deal too. So it just didn't work. Where did you record those vignettes? Because uh, uh, they're still out on the internet today, and people uh, talk about them a lot. Out on uh, the property that I was, I was married into the family. They had property in South Georgia. Okay. Um, did you like the gimmick at all, or was it just a paycheck for you to do that one? Uh, I didn't really like it, you know, the the face paint and all that. But you know, because. That's a pain to get on and off every match to I assume. Yeah. Um, and they ended up making you, uh, oh, actually, you feuded with Goldust as the soccer, right? You were friends with Dustin. For a short time, yeah. And then we became the Blackjacks just real soon. Was there any reason given to making you the new Blackjacks? They just wanted to try something different? No, it was Vince's idea, and, and Bradshaw and I showed up to Chattanooga TV, and we walked in, and he says, where's your black hair? I said, what black hair? He says, you're my new blackjacks. He says, you're on TV tonight. You need to have black hair. So we had to go to the hair salon, get our hair dyed black, dyed our facial hair, 
mustaches and we were on TV that night as blackjacks. <laughs> Uh, what did your father think of that gimmick? I never talked to him about it. Uh, what did you think of uh, JBL? He, you know, he, he is a really smart guy and, and really talented in the ring. You know, I was really close to him there for those two years I was there. Uh, he's just a... You know, John is just a, is just a great guy. He's, he's a great friend to have. Are you surprised at the success he ended up having being a, a world champion later on? No, because I knew Vince liked him too. So, you know, if, if Vince likes somebody, you know, you can tell. And, and he's, you know, he's usually with his guys that he likes. He's going to take care of them. And in recent years, there's been... He's been a little bit controversial for various wrestlers claiming to be bullied, but is that just wrestlers nowadays being a different breed, not really being that tough and being babies, or do you think there's anything to that? Well, John in the dress room is a little abrasive and to young guys and, and, and guys that are new to the business and haven't been around. I can see how he would intimidate them. But, you know, I know him differently and I know, he, you know, he wouldn't hurt if hurt a fly, but he's, he just has those ways about him. You know, he, he can come off as a bully, but you just kind of know him. Were you around during the time that he was in the brawl for all? No. What did you think of that, just out of curiosity? It was an unusual thing to do. Well, first of all, you're taking something that's a show and you're making it a shoot, you know, with, with, with big guys in there. And it was just, it was just a poor idea, I think. You know, just sending guys in there to knock each other out just to see who could knock the other one out is all it was. And of course, that's probably not good for the dressing room either. No, no, it doesn't work for anybody. Towards the end of your WWE run this time, uh, they put you in an angle where you were with Jim Cornette as part of the NWA. Yeah. Um, was there ever any plans to take that further, or was that just kind of? No, it was just a it was just a filler and a time killer, and it was it was strictly temporary. What do you think of this? Uh, I, I don't. You probably don't even know about this, but they have a the singer from the Smashing Pumpkins has bought the NWA name, and he's planning on trying to build up the NWA title again. Do you think that's kind of a lost cause at this point, or? Well, I mean, you know the. The small, uh, the independents and the small territories are making a comeback now, you know, and they're, and they're guys that are able to make a living doing it. And, uh, you know, Vince needs some competition. So, you know, I just hope the guy has the money to, to throw at it that he needs because it's going to take a big pocketbook to compete with Vince. Yeah, what would be your suggestion uh, with all your years in the business to to an up and coming promoter um, that wants to just be able to survive financially? I guess in this uh, this day and age in wrestling. Well, I mean, number one, you got to have TV, and you have to have a good, strong TV. To where you know that's where Vince is. He's on USA now. So I don't know what channel they would get on, but you got to have a, and this is to be successful, you got to be on a, a strong TV, and it's got to be in a good time slot, and you've got to have talent that knows how to work. And if you've got those, you know, you, you, can, you can grind it out and you can make it work. Do you think uh, a more realistic product would be better? Do you think that the way WWE is going now with a lot of comedy, Type stuff and a lot of skits and stuff is the way of the future. Well, you know the the business it goes in waves, and uh, you know it, it it'll come back around to being serious. You know, 
more in-ring uh, stuff instead of skits and stuff. And when you went back to WCW, was that them recruiting you and you making a jump, or was that uh, just your contract running out and you giving WCW a call? Uh, in the end run, when I went back with Bischoff, yeah, I had uh, I had finished up and I'd been with Vince, you know, for two years or two and a half years, and. Uh, Scott Hall, I had talked to him on the phone, and uh, Kevin Nash, I, I talked to both of them, and they said, you know, call Bishop. So I called him, and, uh, and, and you know, we just got the ball in motion to come back there. So I guess you were friends with uh, Hall and Nash from WWE? Yeah. Uh, Scott Hall, I... I kind of halfway trained him down in Florida with Dan Spivey in the early 80s and uh, you know I knew I knew Kevin so you know we were just pals and we were just looking out for each other. Were you in WWF when uh, Spivey had that altercation with uh, Adrian Adonis that's now famous? No, no I wasn't there I don't know anything about it. Okay, uh, apparently Adonis tried to stiff him or something in the ring and they went backstage and Spivey beat the hell out of him. <laughs> uh, Adonis needed it. So you uh, were part of the West Te Texas Rednecks in WCW, which was actually a popular gimmick. I loved it. It was one of my favorite gimmicks in WCW. Um, what did you think about that gimmick? Well. We were originally supposed to be heels, and when we came out and, you know, and Kurt singing, uh, we automatically became baby faces, and, you know, we were working with uh, Master P and his crew, and uh, Conan, and uh, let's see, what's Ray? Uh, uh, anyway, we were working with all that crew, and, uh, no matter what we did, they came out being the heels, and they, and they wanted to be the baby faces. So it's just, you know, that's that's why we just we played on a few shows, and we didn't we didn't wrestle on a few shows. We just did like concerts, and you know, it, it was definitely fun. It was fun to do, uh, but yeah. it just worked opposite from what the company wanted. Yeah, because you even came out with the second song. Do you think that could have actually become much bigger if they had just ran with it? I'm sure if it had gotten more time, it would have, you know, especially with you know, the talent that was involved with me and Kurt and, you know, Bobby Duncan was, was really good and Kendall was good, so. And I heard that uh, Master P was making a ridiculously large amount of money and his No Limit Soldiers who weren't even trained wrestlers were making hundreds of thousands a year. Oh yeah. Yeah. And we were working with them. <laughs> <laughs> so you were probably making, I heard one of the No Limit Soldiers was making like 400,000 a year, which is really sad actually. I'm sure Kendall and uh, Bobby Junk Duncan weren't getting that. Yeah, they weren't. Um, what was Kurt Henning like? Well, uh, you know, Kurt was a really good friend of mine. And he uh, just, you know, just always joking, always smiling, always happy, and uh, you know, phenomenal in the ring. But he just had that uh, that monkey on his back. Just caught him. And uh, I guess they put Virgil, who was kind of out of place in the Rednecks. Was that just to make it seem like a non-racist group? Yeah. 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 Definitely didn't fit in, in the group. Um, what was he like? I guess he didn't ride with you guys. You know, I, I don't know who he rode with. You know, he just, 
he was there and the company put him there and 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 we abided by it you know and it, it wasn't you know we, we were all friendly we were all friends but you know we felt it too that he just didn't fit in and like a guy like Virgil to be honest he's a he's one of like a, a contract that WCW probably didn't even need and they had so many guys like Lanny Poffo had the three-year contract and he didn't even wrestle once yeah do you think WCW might still be around if, if they didn't make mistakes like having way more wrestlers than they used under contract because I can't remember Virgil wrestling in WCW maybe he did but he seemed to not talk or wrestle. I think what happened in WCW is just you had you had let's see I guess the the prisoners were running the prison so that was the way it is and uh, it just doesn't work that way you got to have a boss and he's got to you know he's got to have the say and there's just no way around it but there were just there were just too many people in, in Bischoff's ear and and always, you know, guys trying to go over his head to, to upper management, you know, with, with uh, TBS. And it was just a, it was just a constant jockeying game there. It, it went from being low key to, to the worst place to work. And I guess there was lots of clicks backstage as well. Yeah. Lots of different factions. Um, you had some matches against Chris Benoit. Um, what did you think about him as a wrestler and what happened with him? Well, I mean, in the, in the ring, he was, you know, he was there. You know, he was second to, to none. And he was a great performer. And, uh, he was partners with uh, Dean Malenko and uh, Kurt and I swapped the titles back and forth with them a few times but uh you know they were on their way out too they were getting ready to leave to come to vince yeah there was an unusual situation where the title was put on benoit right before he left um were you aware at all like on who orchestrated that booking decision no no who did that And you had some matches against Harlem Heat. How were they to work with in the ring? Uh, I mean, I can't really remember anybody being difficult to work with. You know, and, and uh, you know, those two guys, you know, they were smooth and, and they were easy. There was nothing to it. Now, did your uh, contract run out after WCW went out of business, or were you released prior to that? Uh, I didn't have a... Uh, I guess my contract ran out before, before uh, Vince bought it. So okay. he, he ran out just before. Were you surprised that Vince ended up buying it? Well, you know, there had been rumors for, for months, but, you know, for, for him to actually move on it and buy it, it, would, it was a surprise. But uh, knowing Vince and the way he operates, it shouldn't be. <laughs> How did you like dealing with Vince Russo? He, he didn't like me and uh, Bradshaw, he, you know, with him being a New Jersey guy, he just, he didn't like cowboys and he, he didn't like our accent, so he just didn't like us at all. So it trans, it's transformed over to WCW too. But I guess in WCW, WCW you had guaranteed money, so it didn't matter as much as WWE. Yeah, and uh, I was out with injuries while he was a booker, so I basically missed him there too. Um, how did your brother uh, like his time in WCW? Because I guess that was his most success. He, you know, Kendall just, you know, he was a late mature. And now, you know, he's, he's an inch taller than I am and weighs 320 pounds. He's, you know, 
know, he's all muscled up. He just, uh, he just, he just missed it. If if he'd have been, uh, if he'd have matured a little earlier, or or if his career had gone on a little longer, you know, he, he really would have made it. But uh, I don't think he, you know, he really liked being on the road away from home, and, and nobody really does. But what's he doing with himself now? He's got uh, a couple of different companies. He's doing all right for himself. He's doing all right. And you eventually became, for a short period of time, a producer in WWE. Um, how did that situation happen? I was there for about two years. I, I had uh, another old injury that needed uh, fixing it, my ankle, which had rolled over and it was completely in a club foot. And uh, when my when my old man was. Uh, introduced into the uh, Hall of Fame in 06. I saw Vince in Chicago and uh, he gave me a job and uh, he fixed my ankle. So I was there for two years as a, as a producer and uh, then I just, I just finished up. Travel was just too much. So was that uh, dealing with finishes and stuff on the road and house shows and stuff? Yeah. And deal with all the talent, and, you know, and take care of them, take care of the shows, reports back to the office, all that. Who were some of the main talent you worked with when you were a producer? Uh, you know, I was, I was uh, in charge of the girls for the first year and a half that I was there. So I did the girls' finishes, and set them up, and did all that. Did you work with uh, Ric Flair's daughter, or was that before her time? Yeah, that was before her. What do you think about uh, the popularity of girls wrestling nowadays, hitting an all-time high? Well, I mean, with with the the way the business was headed, you know, it was just it was only natural for for the girls to be involved, and and now I'm glad that they're getting to actually have matches, you know, instead of you know uh, lingerie matches or hot dog matches or whatever you know they're actually getting to work and, and they're and they're doing really good was there any of the females you particularly liked working with well I mean I I got along with all of them so it really wasn't any problems with any of them uh, was Natalia one of the ones you would have worked with yeah I worked with Natalia and that was when she was just starting. Um, so would you work at the TV tapings with him too, or was it just the house shows? At both, at TV shows and uh, and, and the house shows. Was that, is that something you would like to do more of in the future? No, I'm done with that. Yeah. So for fans that are interested, what are you doing with yourself nowadays? I, uh, I build old pickup trucks and motorcycles. Build uh, custom trucks and motorcycles. How many uh, vehicles do you have uh, personally now? Well, I just moved to a new place, so I had to get rid of a bunch, but I've, just, I've got uh, five right now. One of your uh, nephew, or I guess two of your nephews are now in WWE, Bray Wyatt and uh, Bo Dallas. Um, what's your opinion of them as wrestlers? You must be pretty proud. Uh, you know, Wyndham uh, Bray is really doing well. And I mean, he, he's he's so good on the mic. And uh, and Taylor just needs a chance. You know, he, he's, uh, he's really talented, but uh, to have him do that that bow bow leave thing for so long was just it was just brutal. <laughs> Maybe they'll put them together eventually. Yeah, some people have said that uh, Bo might be better off leaving and going somewhere else for a while and coming back. Uh, do you think something like that would be a good idea for him? Or? I think it's always good to leave and come back. Uh, it's just that you know there's such limited places to go right now, so he'd have to either go to Japan or 
our work on the independent circuit and uh, it takes a special a special kind of person to work uh, all the time on the independent circuit because you got to do all your own travel and you know it's just just it's it's an extra difficulty uh, I could see him going to Japan probably did you have any part of uh, the training of Bray or Bo? No. Um, is there any match of Bray's that uh, stands out to you as one of your favorites? I'm trying to think of, you know, he's just, he's such a talented worker. I can't think of any one match that sticks out in my mind. With your beard the way it's going now, it looks like uh, you're almost ready to join his group. Yeah, I shaved it off this morning. It was big out here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can grow a beard. <laughs> Is there uh, any young wrestler other than, of course, your nephews, uh, that you could see becoming a, the next Hulk Hogan or John Cena in the future? Because it seems like that's going to be a problem. Fine, because the the rocks rocks pretty much retired from pro wrestling. Group. I just don't I just don't see anybody that stands out right now. But I mean, you know, that can change in a week. You know, it's just it's just if somebody hits a promo right or or something. But I just don't see anybody busting out right now. And they've got so much young talent from NXT coming in that you know they keep bringing in young, inexperienced talent, and I don't know, it's just, it's, it seems kind of haphazard to me, the way they do things up there, but they're also dealing with a lot of injuries and their top talent, so they've got to deal with that too. So, I mean, it just, it, it makes it more, uh, more like UFC because, you know, that they have constant turnover, so. It, it just might be the new wave of wrestling, just a constant turnover of top talent. I don't know. Do you think they're now they're giving tryouts a lot to CrossFit athletes and bodybuilders and ex-football players who have been released by NFL and some amateur wrestlers? Um, do you think that's a good thing to be looking more outside of independent wrestlers and getting people that might not have thought of wrestling otherwise well I mean what they're doing is they're just trying to they're trying to do the numbers you know they're, they're trying to run as many people through their uh, school as they can to try to find somebody that's gonna be the next breakout star and you know you won't know until you find them so they just have to keep keep turning over every stone and a lot of people have varying opinions on uh, Roman Reigns. Uh, what did you think of him as a wrestler? Well, I thought that they put him in his in his position when he was a little green and not ready for it. But you know, he, he he's coming to it. He he's earning it. He's going to be all right. It's just it's just taking him a while, and it takes some guys longer to get over and then and to be a fan favorite. And uh, you know, you still hear boos in the crowd for him, but uh, it'll change, it'll be all right. And he had a pretty good match against The Undertaker at WrestleMania last year. Uh, did you ever work with The Undertaker in your time? I'm trying to think of if I did. time I think I worked with Taker was in an enhancement match on a TV and I you know I put him over with his with his uh, tombstone pile driver that was it that would have been um, during your time as the soccer maybe yeah probably towards the end where I was with Cornette and the NWA have you followed uh, TNA at all that that wrestling company I, I did some, but then it, it just got so erratic that it was hard to follow. 
so I just quit watching it. Yeah, a company like that now they're they've dropped the TNA name and they're just calling themselves Impact Wrestling, which was the name of the TNA TV show. Uh -huh. Do you think it's just going to keep going on forever with various owners, or is there something they could do to finally actually get out of their slump? Well, I don't know. I, you know, I would like to think that somebody would come along, but it's probably going to be Vince, you know, to buy them just for their tape library, you know, just to have access to that, and, and it'll be done. And that'll probably happen in the next year or two. You know, Vince is already going back out to the XFL. I saw this morning when I was on the plane, so he's expanding into that you know he's looking for other ways and you know the TNA would help his uh, his 24-hour uh, wrestling channel what do you think about Vince uh, going back into the football game well I mean it, you know like I said before you know it's his money and, and uh, he's the boss but I just I'm sure it has to do with, you know, the way the players have been, you know, not standing for the anthem and stuff like that, which, you know, he, he would he would make sure that, that that kind of stuff didn't happen. But I just, I don't see it being successful. Uh, I mean, not any more successful than indoor uh, uh, football, you know, league football. So it's just... Uh, I don't see it being a moneymaker for him. And what was your uh, favorite opponent? Who was your favorite opponent uh, in your career? Wrestling-wise, I mean, I always enjoyed wrestling with, with, with Flair. But, I mean, I also had really good chemistry with Dustin. But as far as fun in the ring and having fun and, and also having good matches and telling a good story was with Dick Murdoch. There was just nobody like him. And it's just, you know, he, when he wanted to have a serious match, he could have a serious as a heart attack match. But you know, it, was, it was hard to get him out of his goofy moods. And I was one of the people that could do that. So, you know, I always had good matches with him. And what would have been your favorite company to work for? One that keeps their promises and pays you. <laughs> <laughs> the imaginary company. <laughs> and favorite tag team partner? Oh, I, I guess I'd... You know, Rotundo and I are such good buddies, and we're good fishing buddies now. So, you know, he he was my favorite tag team partner. And is there any message that uh, you'd like to say to your fans that they're going to sit through this interview? Well, I mean, uh, I'm back out on the road making some of these appearances and coming to some of these towns, so maybe I'll get to meet you soon. And I'm going to assume you don't, but do you have uh, Twitter or any type of social media where people could uh, find out what you're up to or where you're appearing? I don't really have anything. I've, I've, I've got a couple of Facebook pages, but uh, fans run them and I don't do them. Okay. And if any promoters want to book you for a, an autograph appearance or something, um, is there an email address or who would they get in contact with? At, uh, I, you can get me at my Facebook. It's it's Barry B W Wyndham at Facebook. Thank you very much uh, for doing this interview with us, and uh, we wish you uh, continued success. All right. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.